My name is Taryn Hart, and I'm with Occupy Missoula, and I blog at plutocracyfiles.com. And I'm John Quiggan. I'm uh, currently a visiting professor at Johns Hopkins in Baltimore, and I blog at uh, Crooked Timber and at my own blog, johnquiggan.com. Great. Um, I guess I just wanted to start with your take of, um, I guess, a general diagnosis of you know, the problems with the economy as you see them as particularly relevant to the issues our movement is concerned with? Sure. Well, I think you really need to go back to the 1970s and, and the end of the sort of post-war boom that for a long while seemed to be pushing society more or less gradually in the right direction in terms of greater equality, uh, maintaining full employment, better opportunity and so forth. All of that really... Um, in, was reversed after the crisis of the 1970s, and we saw this steady return of inequality, increased uh, power for the financial system, and uh, the development of a whole set of ideologies that uh, uh, that supported that. Um, you know, uh, Reagan, Thatcher, uh, what's called at least globally neoliberalism, all of these things, and they all, broadly speaking, seem to be working. Say by the late 1990s, you had, of course, the collapse of communism, which unattractive as it was, was, you know, stood it's, it's as an alternative. You had the boom in the, the boom in the 1990s. You had people like Tom Friedman, who's pretty reliable as a weather vane on these things, uh, you know, uh, with the access in the olive tree. Um, so everything seemed to be going well. That hasn't been true really for the last decade or so, that the dot-com crash really undermined a lot of the basis for this. They pumped the economy up again with... Um, um, under Greenspan, uh, uh, just with uh, and and then that, that of course came into this huge crash in two thousand and eight, um, and uh, what I expected initially to see, I guess, coming out of that was a, a fairly rapid return of uh, a fairly rapid downfall of those kind of ideas, and in particular that uh, uh, that we'd see um, from governments a, a big assault on the power of the banking system, but. Um, that wasn't happening. You know, obviously, that didn't happen except for a very brief period. We had a brief period when everybody was a Keynesian and when they were going to do something, and then um, and then very very quickly the banks got back on top and started imposing austerity uh, and so forth. And I was just actually uh, looking over the previous draft of my book, Zombie Economics, which I wrote about this and and saying, well, you know, until we get a class based politics back again. Uh, there's no, going, to, going to be no challenge to this. And at the time, the only thing on offer was, of course, the Tea Party, which was exactly the opposite of, of what, we were, what we were looking for. So um, so the necessity of it seemed obvious, but I guess I was as surprised as anybody when, um, uh, when yeah, I remember first arriving in Washington and going along to a little meeting and people were talking about this, and I thought, well, yeah, that'll be a good protest. At least there's some protest going on. But suddenly it's emerged into this worldwide movement with you know, very widespread popular support, uh, forced the media to take it seriously and so forth. Right. Um, and, you know, you mentioned that, you know, the banks kind of got back on top. So you obviously think there hasn't been enough regulation, enough done to remedy the problems that led to the crash. No, I think if you look at what has been done, it's you know, in the US Dodd-Frank, Globally, Basel III, well, those are, I guess, the sort of minimal adjustments you would try to make if you said, look, let's look at what went wrong last time and try and fix up those particular things. It's no more, it's not saying let's look at the whole system and think where is where are the problems in the system. It's saying let's patch these things up. Let's fix the particular errors, you know, Basel II being, I guess, you know, I don't want to go into lots of boring detail about it, but, but Basel II was, was obviously the epitome of this let, let these guys alone to manage things because they're much smarter than we are stuff. Uh, those were the those were the steps. But, of course, you know, Dodd-Frank has been systematically undermined, weak as it was. You know, all the important bits of it have, have been blocked by, by Wall Street. And I think we're seeing the same uh, with you know, those people in, in, in Europe who are attempting to get some sort of control over, over the banks. Uh, even, you know, of course, we're, we're the European public, like the US public, is bailing them out in a huge way, right. uh, but we're still seeing this very effective resistance. And um, and I think it largely depends, you know, it, it certainly drew strength from the fact that 
the average person seemingly either didn't understand what was going on or believed the kind of anti-stimulus story that the, um, that the Tea Party was telling. So I think suddenly, you know, uh, the emergence of the emergence of the movement linking, I guess, the financial instability with the growing inequality that the we are the ninety nine percent story. I mean, it's exactly what I was writing about in my right. book, so I'm really happy about it. But but right. I guess uh, it's been hugely more successful than, than any book could possibly be. Right. All of a sudden, Doug Henwood said the same thing that he felt like he's been talking about these things for twenty five years, and all of a sudden. There's a lot of interest. Um, he felt like he was talking kind of alone before. Yeah. Yep. You have a, have you started your second book? I feel like you've got a whole new batch of ideas that like expansionary austerity and all kinds of new zombie lies. <laughs> well, so I'm going to, I'm, uh, I've agreed with a paperback edition of, of zombie economics. So an austerity is going to be the, yeah, just bring up to date uh, and add a chapter on austerity is, is my next plan. And I have a sort of, I mean, a less a lot a book for the longer term planned on sort of just just the you know very simple guide to economics for lefties um, book, but uh, until yeah you know, I suppose that, that one's on the back burner while while things such exciting things are happening. So I'm okay. working on austerity as as you know, the zombie lie of, of this uh, oh, of this period. Exactly. I was actually, I was kind of kidding, but yeah, it is. I guess the new zombie lie that one and um, the idea that Fanny and Freddie. Uh, yeah, I probably yeah. That, I mean, I mentioned that a little bit. I mean, yeah, it's it's more. I mean, that's a zombie talking point, I guess. So so I'm I'm aiming at bigger targets. Yeah, if you try yeah, if you try this whack a mole game of, right. of response to every talking point the Republicans bring up, right? You just I mean, it has to be done. But um, right. You know, but you did uh, take on the expansionary austerity. Yeah, because yeah, that because that, that's a big global story. That it's not only here; it's in Europe; it's everywhere. Right. And really, it goes right back to the Treasury view in the 1920s, which were, which and and 30s, which Keynes and people like that were arguing against. So, so it's something, you know, it's a it's a target which right. really needs, yeah, you know, right. keeps on coming back. Which is taking kind of, and it, when you speak of the Treasury view, this this is sometimes referred to as a crowding out argument. That's right. Right, right. The, that. Uh, Freshwater economists such as John Cochran and Robert Barrow yeah. have made. Um, well, that's great that you're taking that on. We'll look forward to seeing yeah. that. I know that, uh, I guess it was some Harvard economist, Alicina. Alicina has, yeah, he's had some work on that topic. So, yeah, so there's a bunch of, I have to sort of try and link the, uh, yeah, the academic literature on it Um uh, some stuff on international experience with with the current politics. So it's it's a challenging thing to do in the number of yeah to to get get right. But I'm right. I'm working on that. But really important, um, given that it it has really dominated policy in Europe in particular, but yes. also in the United States. And I've actually been really curious as to what exactly is the basis for. Well, as I say, I think there's two things. One is one is a, a, you know, a bunch of ideas in economic theory, which we can argue about and look at look at the numbers on. But I think there is a sort of natural masochism about these things that people feel feel we should we should, yeah things have gone bad. We must have done something wrong. You know, in the old days, you know, find your best bullock and sacrifice it. Right, right. So uh, the kind of morality play. Yeah, Economic. and and I mean, and of course there is a morality play element to it. But of course, let let's look at the question. Well, who is it who's been living a high off the hog, and um, and whose irresponsibility has brought this to pass? And it isn't school teachers and firemen and uh, <laughs> right, um, you know, kids under five. I mean, those aren't the people who's who who you know. If we're going to have a morality play, and I think there's a role for that. Uh, you know, that the point is well. Let's point the finger in the right direction. Right. I actually, I think Mike Consul just recently wrote a piece, um, a blog post, discussing um, whether there was maybe whether it was economically motivated these types of arguments. You know, whether it's a rentier class motivated argument or something else. Do you? So, no, I think there's a bunch of things going on. I mean, very clearly, yeah. There's 
a well-established political machine which is there precisely to defend a particular set of economic interests. And in some sense, in some sense, you know, the machine sometimes, I think, runs out of control of its own creators. I mean, I think we've seen that with climate change, that Exxon and a few people like that spend a bunch of money ginning up this movement, but then it's taken on a life of its own. It's become part of the part of the culture war. So Exxon now, I think, would be perfectly happy to make its peace. You know, they're busy, um, busy sort of uh, looking at uh, where they can send their tankers around the Arctic Circle now that there's no ice there and things like that. But um, yeah, they they don't they've turned the tap off in some sense. But you've got all these crazies out there who uh, and a and a self supporting movement. So in some sense, in terms of their own self interest, you know. Wall Street would probably do better not to be, you know, not to be so greedy to settle for twenty percent instead of twenty-five percent of national income and so forth. Right. But the machine's been started and it can't be stopped easily. Right, right. So, what would be in terms of, and I and I don't want to. I mean, we have different issues. You know, one of which is a short-term economic crisis. Another is the problems, the kind of well, the structural problems with the financial institution. Mm. And then also issues about, um, you know, being able to address environmental concerns, being able to address health care, these types of things. So mm. with all of that in mind, what would be your priorities if we were not so insane and caught up in austerity and these types of things? Well, I see them as all tied together in an important sense in the um, particular in the U.S. context, simply because... You know, so much money is going to the top 1% that if you ask the question, well, where are we going to get the resources from to deal with health care? Right. You can't, you know, as, you know traditionally, I, I used to say, well, look, you know, really everybody in the top 20%, people like me need to pay significantly more, you know, and, and indeed everybody needs to pay somewhat more to have better services. We can't just, say, point the finger at, at the rich because there aren't enough of them and they aren't rich enough. Uh, that seems to be true. There are enough of them and they are rich enough that <laughs> unless you start there, um, unless you start there, you really can't tackle all of these problems. Now that doesn't, that's not a complete solution and, and it's more, and and that the pathological degree of inequality is specific to, to the US, although we're seeing the same same trends everywhere. But um, I, yeah, that seems to be um, a necessary feature. I guess, you know, you, you would hope that um, yeah, the other feature of this period has been this incredible monetization of, of everything uh, that um, yeah, is, is in some sense the modus operandi of the financial sector, that, that they're always pushing the boundaries of what things can be, um, um, what thing, what things can be securitized and so forth. And, and, and so I think in important ways that we've missed the point that we really have in ways like, for example, the development of the internet moved outside the market sphere for lots of stuff we do. I mean, the internet wasn't created by internet companies. Yeah, it was, and uh, so I think this really is an opportunity if we can if we can get off this financial treadmill uh, to to really look forward to a much more environmentally sound, globally just world. Uh, but you know, I, I, I see the the power and wealth of that financial elite is really standing in the way of everything at present. Right. So you would want to start with, you know, taxing the wealthy and spending our way out of the current crisis and then kind of de-financializing our economy? Yeah. I mean, I think I think not only, of course, I mean, tax, you know, I'm a policy wonk kind of guy, so I instantly think in terms of tax and welfare, but there's also – the distribution of market income in the first place, and so we've, you know, so those two things go together. That if we cut back the size of the financial sector, um, you know, that that would have have big effects in the first place, and it would also, you know, to the extent that you weaken the power of global financial markets, uh, make it feasible to do things like repeal some of the anti-union laws, try and get, you know, try and resuscitate trade unionism, uh, things that would uh, improve the position of um, Improve the position of workers in the labour market, uh, as opposed to uh, as opposed to trying to say, well, look, here's this income distribution that that's been thrown at us. Let's try and tax our way back towards something more equal. Right. Uh, 
and I'll, I'm going to use just as a jumping off point, um, get your thoughts. Mike Consul had written a piece early on uh, when this movement started suggesting concrete demands. Uh, the demands word has become, we, we kind of want to avoid the demands word. Yes. Uh, but just in terms of kind of brainstorming ideas about what potential solutions would be. And I believe his, th his top three were uh, canceling the debt, uh, holding Wall Street accountable, having some criminal prosecutions, and a financial transaction tax. And so I wanted to get your thoughts on those ideas. Sure. Okay, so the financial transactions tax is, is probably at the top of my list, and I had a post you know, making, you know, saying, well, this is something It's, it's something that's been around for a while. We've, I mean, I think you, know, you, you can toss around the theory, but most of the arguments against really assume in the first place that the financial sector is doing a pretty good job. Um, and so once you take that, you know, and the people who argue against it are really talking as if, oh, well, we had this little unpleasantness a few years ago, but we don't want to upset the apple cart any further. So I suppose that would be at the top of my list. I think... Um, I think, yeah, some, I mean, uh, in terms, yeah, so, so something big in terms of, of the various debts that have been built up, I think there has to be, yeah, so that's um, I, yeah, probably in some ways a more significant short-run step, and it varies a lot, you know, in, uh, but we really need some inflation, obviously, to just say, look, all of this, you know, we've, at this point, at this point, it's impossible among debtors and creditors to say, well, who are the bad ones and who are the good ones? We, you know, Too much debt was created. It can't be made. The debtors are certainly suffering. The creditors, all, you know, all of them innocent guilty have to suffer a bit. And that means um, that means you know, some inflation, some write-downs, all those kinds of things. I guess I'm, I'm on the Wall Street thing. I, I guess I've come to the conclusion that that oddly is it, Enough is that I don't think there is any scope for criminal prosecutions, and I think that's an important point in favour of the movement. It, it is the case, as far as I can tell, that almost no. I mean, Bernie Madoff got off with sixty billion dollars, and there's probably a, yeah. I mean, there's there's always some criminals out there, but if you look at the leading, if you look at the the leading figures, the the Goldman Sachs's and all these people, the crime is that it was all perfectly legal. None of them. Did anything criminally wrong, from what I can tell, and um, and so again, the point is to hold the whole system responsible rather than to have one of these perp walks where we identify, you know, ten or twenty, you know, you know, as was done with the dot com crisis. Show, you know, I mean, there were a bunch of people who went to jail over that. Well, that didn't do us any good at all. I think I think the difficulty is to try, yeah, you know, you know, the difficulty is that heart most of these people have managed to retire and walk away with all this money that's going to be very difficult to claw back in any fashion. But um, but my view is, you know, it's, it's collective guilt rather than individual guilt that's the, uh, the issue here. Right. Um, and in terms of, you know, debt restructuring, uh, I mean, do you think there's, you know, one of the theories, and I don't want to get too into jargon, is that, you know, we're the demand is being held back by balance sheet problems. That yeah, I mean, I, um, yeah. So I think there's a bunch. There's yeah. There's almost certainly a bunch of yeah. A, a good deal of that. Um, right. That there's a debt a thing. Of, right. To yeah. use and, kind of rogue off Reinhardt terminology. Yeah. So I think. I mean, I think yeah. We're a part company with those guys, of course. That yeah. I mean, they're very much on the. I mean, although analytically I sort of agree with them as opposed to the Chicago these are people are very much on the right and I think yeah their hostility to fiscal stimulus I think doesn't make a lot of sense so I think I think as well as, yeah I think I, I would say we need yeah if we really need another big round of fiscal stimulus uh, contra to various people I keep on arguing with on the left we need in, in the end if we're going to maintain that it needs to be paid for and it needs to be paid for by the top one percent largely uh, but yeah, we also need to fix up, yeah, fix up these overhanging debts. Yeah, the house, the house debt. I think yeah, my, I would say, uh, you know, in my grand plan, we we try for a large scale write down, and the payoff for that is we kill the mortgage interest deduction, which in the US, which is really serves only to uh, benefit existing house owners and to prop up and to, and to push house prices higher now. That, that yeah, it really was a cause of the problem. So so that would be a sort of part of the package. 
some sort of re redo on student, yeah, at least for the future, some sort of redo on student student loan financing. I think is needed, and I think at a minimum, I think yeah, we need to repeal the bankruptcy exemption and, and yeah, and, and uh, the bankruptcy exclusion and things like that. And then the Europe, the Europe problem has a whole bunch of complexities of its own. But the basic thing is, I think that we just need to accept that yeah, the rules have all been broken across a range of things. The idea that debts are a sacred bond, yeah, companies don't believe that. They go bankrupt and default on their debt and reappear, uh, yeah, uh, having um, having conveniently got out of their obligations. Yeah, that's yeah. So we, should, I think, the kind of mora- again, the kind of morality player that says, well, you pay your debts. Well, that might be true if you, if I borrow ten dollars from you. It's not true in a world where debt is essentially a financial instrument. Right. Um, Created in this way, so I think we need to we need to do a bunch of big things about debt. As I say, how much effect that would have, I don't know. I think we certainly need direct. Well, we certainly need to withdraw to end austerity at a minimum, uh, and you know start putting people back to work. As I guess, you know, the jobs the jobs bill finally sort of suggested some tiny steps in that direction. So that's that's good. But not near enough. It sounds like not near enough, enough. and of course, it only symbolically. You know, not. I mean. Um, well, I, I don't think it's worth going over the missteps made by made by the administration. But um, um, you know, if that if that bill had been presented you know, three years ago, as Mitt Romney more or less said, <laughs> yeah, we might we might we might in fact, we would have had a very different history. Um, right. As it is, I guess people have people have taken a long time before we've we've broken out into things like Occupy Wall Street. Right. Uh, right. I mean, I think in large part because there was a lot of hope put in Obama yeah. in 2008. Um, mm. Yeah. And and I guess I was I was surprised just in political terms that having got in in the crisis, he didn't, he didn't say, you know, if, he, if his advisors told him he couldn't do two things, say, well, look, healthcare is now going to be for my second term. This term is going to be all about jobs. I mean, that's, I would have thought, politically a no-brainer, but... Um, but it didn't happen, and so we've, we've ended up. Um, and of course, yeah, the ties between the administration and Wall Street were so incredibly close. Um, and are. And are. I think. Yeah, I think. Uh, yeah, as I say, I think a positive feature of this is that it, that it's going to be that that tie is going to be forcibly broken. I think simply by the fact that Wall Street can see now there's so much pressure on Obama that he can't be as nice to them as the other side would be. And and so they're already, I think, jumping ship. Right. Had a and, and hopefully that will be a cumulative process. That the more the more they favour the other side, the more the less the we are free and forced to um, uh, to go our way. Whether whether uh, whether they can understand that that I'm I'm not confident, but we will see. I I just want to um, I think what I hear you saying, and I and again I'm going to refer to Mike Consul. He's done such a great job. I think he's kind of a natural uh naturally likes to uh kind of chart what the various areas of disagreement are and where everybody stands and he had recently done a kind of venn diagram and it sounds to me and he had for the people who are demand siders he had a separate Mm -hmm. venn for kind of the supply side crowding out folks but for people who are the demand siders he had uh you know three prong, three different areas, which were fiscal stimulus, monetary stimulus, and and mortgage restructuring or debt restructuring. Mm. And it sounds to me like you're in the middle of that, Ben, but that you would support all three of those aggressively. Yeah, although I guess I, I would say, you know, I mean, as, as compared to other people, I'm probably less Less keen on monetary stip. Yeah, I, yeah, I'm, I'm as they, as was said, a new old Keynesian. I mean, I mean, uh, compared to compared to others, say, say Paul Krugman, who I general, generally agree with, would say, well, look, in general, we don't use fiscal policy. It's only in this last resort situation. Whereas I guess I would be, look, yeah, whenever, yeah, let's let's use active fiscal policy all the time. Um, and yeah, and coordinate fiscal and monetary policy. So I'm, I'd say. Yeah, I'm more a fiscal policy person than yeah. And again, with mortgage restructuring, I sort of see that as well. Yeah, that, that's a one-off thing we need to do to fix things up. Right. Um, 
but yeah, yeah, in general, in general, I guess I sort of see um, uh, see generous bankruptcy as this sort of political substitute for income redistribution. So places like Texas are good places to go bankrupt, but bad places to be poor. And so I guess while I sort of see the need for, for debt restructuring on a once-off basis, um, yeah, I'm, ba yeah I'm, I'm more of a naturally, yeah, my thinking naturally leans more towards fiscal policy than, than the other two, but, but we need all three. Right. Well, and there's there's a lot of question. I don't want to get too terribly technical, and it's hard yeah. not to when you get into this discussion. But, you know, there's real questions about how uh, effective monetary policy can be when you're up against the zero hmm. bound, when you're in the... That, that's right. Yeah. Um, and so I think, yeah. Uh, yeah, as I say, I think if we, I, I think, yeah, this isn't anything, I don't want to get on to the boring technicalities of it too much, but I think... We clearly need to, for a bunch of reasons, both sort of political economy and whatever reasons, abandon the inflation targeting regime, recognise that it led us to disaster, go to a nominal GDP level target. And the good thing about this is that it gives us, it automatically creates a demand for a once-off inflation to, to inflate away some of the debt. Right. Uh, and then we get back to something where the goals of policy aren't really that much different from what they always were. We all we don't want high inflation for its own sake, um, but we have we, it gives us the excuse, yeah, you know, gives the gives the central banks the excuse to say, well, in this once off, yeah, you know, to get us back to our level target, we're going to need to raise the price level a bit because it's fallen short. So that would be, but yeah, I'm, I guess coming out of a training back in the sixties and seventies, the feeling with monetary policy was always well, we're in a recession. Even when you're not right at the lower bound in a recession, monetary policy is really pushing on a string, was what we used to say. Right. Uh, yeah, but if you want something to happen, go out and make it happen. You know, fiscal policy actually spends money. You're not relying on these right. indirect effects through interest rates. Right, and it doesn't have this problem of having to affect expectations. Yeah, right. No, exactly. Right, uh, which I guess is the... Uh, so monetary policy, I think, has inherent difficulties, although I'm sure monetarists yeah. like Scott Sumner would disagree yeah. vehemently with me. Um, mm -hmm. One of the things, you know, Paul Krugman very briefly wrote about and then talked about in a London School of Economics lecture that, you know, he really thought that, I guess he suggested that our system is inherently unstable, that it can go for maybe a generation, but not much more. And there's certainly concern, I think, I don't hear a lot of talk among economic folks about the fact that this thing is really crashing too much. <laughs> and yeah. how, how do we, can we get our handle on that? How do we get a handle on that? And yeah, and no, I, I honestly don't know because, yeah, I mean, I'm old enough to remember when we thought we had all this stuff fixed, as the Keynesians had it all fixed, and that all fell in a gigantic heap, and fell in a heap because, you know, in large measure of overconfidence, I mean, part of it was overconfidence among, you know, business people who had been scared in responsibility when, you know, when, you know, the first of the financial operators started, but it's also true that, that the left went, you know, assumed that we could do what we liked and that the system would always be there pretty much. Um, yeah, that, that if, we, if we heightened the contradictions a bit, that, um, uh, that you yeah, know, the outcomes could only be good, instead of which uh, we, we precipitate, yeah, the, the um, certainly outside the US, less so in the US, but, yeah, the wage, yeah, the huge wage demands and, and things like that, that that happened. But the general air of sort of unreal is, you know, demand the impossible and so forth that were, was there. Well, we demanded the impossible and we got Ronald Reagan. So, yeah, that sort of, uh, yeah, so, so I think, and a lot of that was, you know, reflected the assumption that, well, really, you could be pretty responsible because the system, you know, the system couldn't get much, you know, it was, you know the system was, was going to stay very strong and couldn't, couldn't be brought, brought crashing down. And so, so, you know, I think there's a obvious a concern was supposing we managed to get the things we want out of out of this, whether suggestions or demands or ideas. Right. If they're successful enough, you know, you can easily see that we could start overshooting and, and get things wrong. I guess you have to hope that we can learn from history. I think in some ways, you know, the um, 
the, the kind of you know, the growth of sort of environmentalism and things will, will, will in some ways, I think, cut against that in terms of trying, yeah, if we can get, if, if we, while attacking poverty, we can also sort of encourage a less materialist view of the world, let, yeah, less demands for those things, that might, that might help us to be more sustainable in the long term. But I suppose for the moment, I think, yeah, let's, let's fix this crisis and try and get back on the right track and then hopefully we'll remember not to get too greedy ourselves uh, if we ever get the chance to be, but for, for the moment it's the greater the one percent, I guess, that's the problem. Right, uh, and I guess somewhat maybe related is, I mean, I'm trying to get a sense, I get a sense from most of the economic folks that there's a feeling that the problems really are political as opposed to economic, that we know what to do, not with any kind of um, unanimity, but certainly among certain people. Yeah, I think, yeah. I, yeah. I think there's a short run sense in which that's true. That is, there's a large, you know, a large group of people, which includes, you know, obviously all of the sort of Keynesian faction of the economics profession, but, mo well, I mean, at least in its better modes, even people like the IMF, I mean, they've, they've backed and filled and gone in different directions. Yeah, in terms of what should we do this year, and what and yeah, how should how should or even what should what should we do in terms of fiscal and monetary policy over the next five years? I think there's a pretty clear a pretty clear understanding of of what uh, a pretty clear understanding uh, that's very widely shared, and the primary obstacles to it are are political. But then if you ask, um, you know, what should we do about the financial system? I think the answer is we really. You know, there really isn't that. I mean, uh, yeah, um, uh, yeah. Should should we and can we make it a lot smaller than it is? For example, I mean, I, I certainly think we should, but I don't have a compelling analysis, and and um, yeah, it's it's very yeah, and and very clearly, uh, lots of people are still trying to say let's stabilise it and make it less risky, but let's not try and yeah, let's let's accept that we'll still have pretty much the kind of central role that it's had over the last 20 or 30 years. Um, or if they're not, yeah, even, yeah, or they're simply not thinking in those terms. So, yeah, they're simply not, yeah, they're not, they're, they're thinking about, yeah, they're thinking about the stabilisation question and they're not really thinking about, yeah, and they're really just taking it for granted that that broader question will be left to the market to sort out in some sense. Right. Yeah, and I guess kind of related to this, um, in terms of whether it's a economic problem, a political problem, you know, we've even without the crash and even without the financial crisis, we've been unable to address the environment, healthcare, critical issues. Uh, do you see that as also a political issue as opposed to an economic issue? Well, I think it's. I mean, it is. Um... Uh, again, well, certainly I think the environmental issue is, is almost entirely political and, and indeed cultural. So, so going way across the economic policy spectrum, you wouldn't find many people who, um, you know, there's a tiny fraction of, of, of you know, people who are culturally invested in the, in the, in the Republican Party culture, you know, probably more, you know, quite a few at Chicago, for example, I'd say, who... Yeah, who even a science denial, yeah, our closet science denialists in 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 a lot of cases, and very clear. Yeah, which I mean, since anybody numerate can tell these guys are, are full of it. Yeah, these these people who really I think have lost intellectual standards. But that's a, a pretty small group. Right across the profession, you've got very yeah, very widespread agreement that rel a relatively modest carbon price, done one way or another, would you know, uh, yeah yeah there are various ways to do it. That that would uh, if we could get there would you very substantial benefits at um, yeah at quite modest costs wouldn't entail the end of capitalism as we know it and all these things. Uh, so yeah, in that sense, yeah, the, the obstacles are very much that for, uh, yeah for one yeah for various reasons. As I say, I think not so much not by design, but yeah by yeah that by people like Exxon having created a monster they can't control that it's become an issue of cultural symbolism. Like yeah, it's you, you could predict people's views on this. Much better from their views on gay marriage, I would predict, than from their views on, uh, you know, economic policy. Um, that that it has become this cultural tribal issue for the uh, uh, for the right, and yeah, they've they've been, in, you know, they've really 
uh, blocked it in ways which uh, we look back on, I think, with horror. Healthcare is a much more you know, a straight economics issue. There's a lot of money, a lot of money there, a lot of very powerful economic interests, the pharma companies, the insurance companies, the you know, medical lobby all, all have their views, all, all are, are defending their corner. Um, it's something where, you know, but I mean, you know, that said, you know, we, we had, you know, we, the, I mean, the, the Bush uh, pharma bill, you know, the Bush prescription drug bill was pretty terrible, but, but it, it was you know, a response to the need. Obama's legislation, again, not great. Mate, you know, so, so, I mean, pro, yeah, that's an area where I think, you know, the US, of course, is an outlier, you know, in, you know, in other places that the problem is to defend their past achievements rather than moving forward. So I think, you know, I don't want to give up too much on those things. Right. But very clearly, all of this is against a background of, of very constrained budget resources. And when you ask why they're constrained, the answer is because more income is going to the rich and they're paying less tax. Do you have the sense that among economists, uh, among Keynesian economists, that there's a pretty broad um, agreement in terms of what we should do, at least in the short run? Yeah, I would. I would say the general view is, you know, I mean, clearly that the world needs substantially more fiscal stimulus right. and you know, more, more, you know, more expansion, and that you know the. Uh, you know, the concerns about crowding out can be addressed once, once we're back near full employment where there's, where there's something to be crowded out. So I think, I, you know, I really don't, you know, I think the big problem with the other side of this story you know, is the crowding out story, if it's true, also implies the economy should always be at full employment. And if it isn't at full employment, it must be due to unions or high or government wage, minimum wages or something like that, and looking at, well, particularly the US, you really have to twist yourself into knots to think, yeah, the poor old AFL-CIO is somehow you know, stopping stopping workers from taking low-wage jobs or you know, a minimum wage that's, in real terms, way below where it was 20 or 30 years ago is this big obstacle to employment. Yeah, those things are just incredibly hard to believe. And so they come up with these fairy stories about uncertainty about regulation or... Structural yeah, stuff. employment. Stru yeah. Structural yeah. employment, right? Yeah, and and these things, yeah. I mean, not, you can't take them seriously, yeah. Um, but they're that, coming from really, you know, it's not like it's just coming from politicians or kind of, you know, no. I mean, Casey Mulligan, who is yeah, right a professor. I know. Well, I mean, no, I think I think I mean it is. Yeah, yeah, I think. It is quite scandalous, and we really are—we really are, I think, you know, getting to a point in the economics profession where we are. Yeah, you know, we, we've all sort of, in some sense, got along. And you know, back in before the crisis, yeah, you know, the different macro schools were sort of talking to each other, hoping to resolve their differences in the manner of reaching out across the aisle and this kind of thing. I think, yeah, you know, we really are in a point where people like Krugman and me are looking at these Chicago guys and saying, "You're lying." You, know, you can't seriously believe this stuff. And, um, and they're, they're coming back with the same to us, um, I guess. Um, and so you we're really, you know, uh, we really at some point on those issues, you know, we'll have, you know, may have, you know, we, we really aren't operating as an economics profession. Yeah. I mean, it's, it is, it is a problem that, um, yeah, you then have ceremonies like giving the Nobel Prize and, you know, one guy's you know, giving it to people who say say the other guy is not only wrong but in some sense willfully wrong. Right. Uh, that's um, that really yeah. I think it it really is something which is going to uh, uh, yeah make our conferences considerably less <laughs> <laughs> jovial affairs in the near future. Right. Right. I mean, you know, Krugman wrote fairly early that it wasn't so much that the economics profession didn't see this particular crash coming at the particular time, but that they didn't, they couldn't see the, even the possibility of it happening. At least the, the freshwater folks couldn't. Mm. And the saltwater folks, for, by and large, thought to the extent it could happen, that it could be completely handled by the Fed, right? Yeah. So we were really not equipped to handle the economics profession wasn't in a good position to handle the situation. And it's yeah. maybe allowed various economic interests to 
assert themselves, political economic interests to assert themselves because of the confusion. There's that. I think there's also, yeah, I mean, I, you know, there's, I think all of that was true, that really when you look, the new Keynesians, you know, new is one of those things like new Coke or whatever, it, right. they've made a lot of concessions, you know, they made a lot of concessions the other side so that when, you know, I would say, yeah, people like me and Rubini and others were saying, you know, were saying, no, this is really bad and it's going to be really hard to fix. Uh, and, yeah, and people, in, even the head of our Australian Reserve Banks said, well, look, something bad might happen and if it does happen, it will be hard to fix. So there were people, no one, I think, called, you know, because there simply was no one in the world who simultaneously had the, had the economic model and the detailed knowledge of what was going on inside Wall Street to... Um, uh, to actually call things literally as as they happen, but but there was still a bunch of people out there who sort of looked at big big imbalances and just said, yeah, in the past this has led to nasty things and it probably will in the future. And yeah, I was in that group along with other pe- yeah a moderate number of other people, but the majority of people really uh, yeah, and even people like me sort of said, well, look, I've been saying this for so long, yeah, <laughs> maybe these guys really have cracked it. Sure, yeah. I wouldn't have thought they could survive past two thousand and one, and they did, but. Right. When you say imbalances, are you talking about economic inequality? Yeah. Well, in inequality, the growth of the financial sector, trade imbalances, okay. all those things historically have have been associated with big and you know, intractable crises. And um, right. And here we are. Uh, yeah. Right. And so, but yeah, that that yeah, that was at the level. It wasn't something that you could really put in, you know, published in an economics journal. And indeed, it still isn't. I mean, yeah, one of the scandals I think is how little, yeah, how little the day-to-day practice of economics has changed as a result of the crisis. Right. Well, and and how unfazed so many yeah. of them seem. Right. Yeah. And I suppose, oh, yeah, to give the hopeful version of this story. I mean, if you look, yeah, you sort of. Think well, Great Depression, Franklin Roosevelt, New Deal, but yeah, the the crash, the Wall Street crash was in twenty nine, and yeah, the New Deal didn't start until thirty three. So I mean, right, and and you know, and worse is that FDR is really the exception. In Europe, you have Hitler, yeah. Stalin, Mussolini, yeah. right? I yeah. mean, the democratic solution is not the rule. Yeah. No, but I, mean, I think I think there were other factors there, but yeah, that's right. But I think I think I suppose to give the positive version of this, it really does take it. People don't don't people generally don't think that much. I suspect. I mean, there's lots of things to think about in your daily life without you know right. trying consistently trying all the time to recalibrate your your views on a whole bunch of issues well, like this. And so it takes. Yeah, it takes, I think, a few years for for those kinds of things to percolate through to the point, yeah, well, where we see that something which, yeah, if, yeah, quite probably, I think, had, yeah, had something like Occupy Wall Street happened on the left three or four years ago, yeah, it would have been, yeah, a complete flop. People would have just said, yeah, oh, yeah, something seems to have gone wrong, but, you know, there's a smart guys, I'm sure they'll fix it up. Yeah, I mean, the Tea Party was ready because they, they've been telling themselves these stories. Right. About democratic, even right-wing democratic presidents for for twenty years, so so you could tap into that, but there wasn't that sort of feeling that, yeah, the feeling was really yeah that this system fundamentally works well for everybody, and something seems to have screwed up, but yeah, surely yeah, I don't really understand it. It's too hard. Right. Yeah, wait and see, sort of thing. Right. And especially with Obama, yeah, the hope hopes we've had in Obama, I guess. So. Right. I just remember that there was a lot of talk about, you know, we're not going to make the mistake of Japan in 1997, yeah. 1937 mm-hmm. was all the talk. And there was, mm-hmm. it sounded like people were going to do well, the I think, yeah, I think that that talk was confined to a, a tiny, tiny group of people who were not, yeah, so a group of people who are neither very numerous, yeah, very numerous in the sense that, yeah, the average, yeah, the average person in the street was worrying about Lehman Brothers, but they weren't worrying about Japan or 1937. Right, right. And the people in power pretty rapidly turned out to be, you know, I mean, yeah, the, the, pe- the people within the Obama administration who thought like that got marginalised very early on. So you had a bunch of people like us talking to each other about this and, and assuming for a long while that, you know, that the folk, good folks and the White House would see the sense of what we were saying and, and do the right thing. And um, whether that was even whether it was even whether even they had the power 
in a political economy sort of sense to do that stuff is kind of, yeah, well, it's academic now, but um, uh, whether they could have or whether the pushback would have been so effective uh, from, yeah, from Wall Street that, yeah, and within the Democrat Party, of course, because, yeah, they own so many senators and and things that, that it wouldn't have been feasible even had Obama wanted to, I don't know. Right. Who do you think are the ho deficit hawks in the administration? Is it Obama himself? Is it Geithner? Well, well, I mean, I think, I don't think Obama thinks much about, the, I think instinctively he is. Um, Hawkish? Um, I don't, yeah, I, I suspect that, I just, yeah, I mean, so I think, um, I think there's, I think with Obama and even more so with Daly, and I suppose, yeah, the fact he chose him is, is a story, it's more of a sort of incredibly deep commitment to the centrist narrative. And so, and so in a sense, I mean, that's, you know, that, and the centrist just, uh, you know, it's all, you know, the story is we're going, you know, you, know, you can see on the West Wing, yeah, you know, 15 years ago, we're going to reach this grand bargain and we're going to sort out social security and all this stuff. And really a bunch of, a bunch of stories that haven't changed, you know, haven't changed at all, you know, haven't changed at all in response to the crisis. And I think suddenly, you know, that's, that's been one of the effects of Occupy Wall Street, you know, the so-called overs and windows moved. You know, suddenly these people open their eyes and think, oh, gee, yeah, maybe, maybe there is, yeah, maybe there is a problem here. And, um, uh, but, but yeah, so I think, I think the attitude has been not, you know, not so much that in some theoretical sense as Jefferson Talk has, his idea is you get all the smart guys in one room, you know, if you've been paid a million dollars a year, you're probably smart, um, and the smart guys will work out the solution uh, free of the extremes of both sides um, right. and, and all that kind of thing. And so I think that's been the, that's been the story. And, of course, then you've got, you know, yeah, I mean, I think the other side of it has been the, you know, some you know, people like Ithan, obviously, their job is to maintain the financial system more or less as it is. Um, yeah, that's what he's done for a living for, for all of his life. So um, unsurprisingly, that's his view. Right. Well, did you have anything else to add that you think it's important for people associated with our movement to know about or? No, look, I mean, I, I guess I just, I mean, I think, well, obviously, I, I don't, yeah, I, say I don't think we need to think much about demands or those kind of things, but there is, I suppose, a question of, well, look, yeah, at some point it has to go beyond Occupy, and I don't, yeah, and the question, is, yeah, that, that's a tactic which has, has been incredibly great and, yeah, potentially could run for, yeah, a year or, or yeah, for a while, yeah, but, I mean, having seen long, you know, ultimately, you know, every, every strategy and tactic gets old, and so I suppose, the, yeah, the big question is where to from here. I don't have a, I don't have an answer to that. But, you know, it's, returning to the Democratic Party doesn't sound promising. I think you know, the idea of revolution is rightly discredited. Where, you know, where, where do we go? What kind of what kind of popular movement can we build on this? I suppose is the big question that I yeah uh, and yeah uh, uh, I, I couldn't predict the success of this one, so I'm, I'm certainly no better at answering it than, than everybody else. But. I certainly hope, we'll, yeah. And I suppose the other thing is just, yeah, it's yeah, it's just great that people are doing this, and yeah, it's it's been a huge success, and I think um, yeah. So for the moment, just just hang in there. I suppose is the is the message. Right. Have you noticed that the has has the conversation changed in the past month? Oh, that's absolutely. I think. I mean, I mean, really massively. I think the the effect has been suddenly that things that. Things, things that would have been laughed at or ignored are now central to the conversation. And, yeah, you know, I think the dynamic has been, yeah, you know, the effects have been huge. And it reflects the fact that, you know, that widespread popular opinion has been crystallised around these ideas now. Right. And what, so where, where are you, when you're home, where do you live? What city? Yeah, in Brisbane, Australia. So in Brisbane, uh, which is very beautiful and you should come and visit sometime. And right. Uh, that's peripheral, far from the centre of any kind of power as you can possibly be. But there you are. Occupy movement there. Uh, we have in Australia, and in fact, we had we had uh, the Melbourne movement just had a big um, conference. Uh, uh, one of one of the rare cases, indeed, where the police have just come in and you know, batons and, and yeah, uh, Brisbane. 
people have been lying back in Brisbane. I'm sure we've got something, but it hasn't been very big, I don't think. Right. And of course, we don't have a financial sector to occupy, so that makes it. Right, right. But yeah, I was going to, I wanted to give a little bit of a shout out to Melbourne because. Yeah, I mean, no, well, that, that, yeah, I mean, I think, I, I think, I hope that it will have the same effect as um, our friend in New York with the pepper spray. He certainly, he certainly was a hero of the movement, even if he doesn't, <laughs> didn't want to be. So. Right. So I think, um, well, thank you. Thank you so much for agreeing to talk to us. I hope that <laughs> you and your colleagues will be hard at work figuring out how to fix <laughs> this mess. And and uh, hopefully the political will can yep. result. Um, yep. Well, glue to the keyboard. But, yeah, it, it's obviously in the streets. It's just is has achieved more in yeah a few weeks than... Thousands and thousands and thousands of words. <laughs> right, but they're important too when it comes. They are, to yeah. It. No, I think that's right. No, there, there's, 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 there's both, both parts are important. So. Um, right, right, and we hope that the other will become important. We hope that there will yeah. be real solutions because there is real suffering that's happening. Yeah. So, well, thank you so much. Thanks a lot. I enjoyed it. Okay. okay. Bye bye. Bye.